This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Truth and Muse Creative Consulting was born in response to Tina's extreme burnout and exhaustion with the business-as-usual narrative. Although no stranger to hard work, the COVID-19 pandemic sent her into overdrive. As a psychotherapist, she felt the heaviness of her own lived experience and those of her clients. With the pandemic, the constant breaking news cycle of political and social unrest, and a string of devastating loss within Tina's family and village, she was ready for a change. On March 1st, 2022, she decided to walk away from her safe nine to five job to rest, grieve, and reset her focus and energy into creating Therapy Works LLC, a solo therapy practice, and Truth and Muse LLC. Truth and Muse promotes community wellness and advocacy through culturally informed and creative consulting practices, coaching, and content creation. Through Tina J. Rutherford's consulting and coaching work, she supports individuals, groups, and organizations to meet their goals in a two-step process. Truth, assessment, inventory, and muse, innovation and creative solutions. Tina's therapeutic training, keen eye for detail, and problem-solving skills give a unique lens into the coaching and consulting world, highlighting the importance of both process and outcomes. Valeria interviews Tina J. Rutherford. She's a licensed clinical social worker and change agent with a passion for mental health and community outreach. In her therapy practice, she provides culturally responsive care to adults ages 18 to 99 plus. Tina's therapeutic approach includes person-centered, psychodynamic, strengths-based, and trauma-informed methods. She recognizes the importance of the therapeutic relationship, inviting full humanness in her work, and the freedom to speak the unspeakable without judgment. She invites curiosity as a lens to journey through life's most joyful and painful parts. Tina also acknowledges the socio-cultural and political impacts on one's overall mental, emotional, and physical well-being and incorporates the close examination of micro, meso, and macro level factors. Tina grew up in the DMV, obtaining a bachelor's degree in sociology from Bowie State University in 2005 and her master's degree in social work from Washington University in St. Louis in 2007. Tina has received postgraduate training at the Washington School of Psychiatry, WSP, and is an active committee member with the School Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Culture, CSREC. Her clinical experience has allowed her to work in a variety of settings, including intensive outpatient, IOP, nonprofit community-based organizations with children and families, the public school system, therapeutic group homes for adolescents, as well as six years with a group therapy practice in Capitol Hill, Washington, D.C., working with a diverse client base. Following the 2020 pandemic, Tina expanded her work to include her solo teletherapy practice, Therapy Works LLC, and Truth and Muse LLC, a creative consulting company focused on wellness, content creation, and capacity building. Tina believes in creating healing spaces both within and beyond the therapy session. She also believes that individual healing becomes collective healing. Meet Tina at linktr.ee backslash Tina underscore J underscore Rutherford. Here's the interview with Tina J. Rutherford. In your own words, who is Tina J. Rutherford? Tina J. Rutherford. I'm a human, God-loving, a Black woman, 
truth seeker, pursuer of healing, a creative, a lover of music and nature, a daughter, cousin, niece, friend, and a partner. What, where, and who is God to you? Well, I'm a Christian. And with that, God to me is, I'm surrounded. And so I I grew up as a Christian. I am a Christian, but I'm not uh, limited to being curious and incorporating other beliefs, understandings when it comes to my journey of seeking truth, alignment, and wholeness. Um, And so God to me just feels like a hug, meaning um, I, I feel as though I'm a part of something so much bigger than myself. And even when life doesn't make any sense, with God, it makes sense. I have clarity in moments that feel, um, you know, absolutely pulled apart. It's a feeling. It's an alignment. I love that. Yeah. I'm trying to find a different word to describe because I know feelings and emotions are experienced through senses, through the body and mind. So I'm wondering if there is another Ah, another sensory perception that's much more subtle that God, as you speak of, can be felt. Would you say intuition? Intuition? Yeah. Na- nature. So, so when I say, say nature, there, there's a surrounding of going back to when things don't make sense and I see a tree or a rabbit or the sky that I'm able to see that I'm a part of something so much bigger than myself. Um, and so you're right. I mean, there's that intuition, that connection, uh, that hug that I mentioned earlier. Um, I, I would say I've found God most in my times of grief and sorrow. And, uh, you know, just that in itself of, of knowing that hug, that connection, that link uh, that keeps me um, with and connected with my ancestors, with those who have left before me and the people that, you know, I'm still sharing this world with. It's, it's like you said, feelings or sensations, they come, they go. But this type of sensation and intuition is, is very deep, mm, yes. calming, peaceful. What do you feel is the purpose of the human experience? Why are we here? Would you say to discover this subtlety? of presence that you call God, I call divine force, love. Yeah. Um, We are here, and and let me give a disclaimer of, I'm speaking of truth from my lived experiences perspective. Uh, And so I see myself as a part of a collective. And with that being said, uh, we can often, in, in this very busy world, focus in on being the expert of or knowing it all or, uh, you know, uh, the expert, essentially. And I see our purpose is to connect with one another, to be able to celebrate one another's gifts, to honor one another, to identify differences in some ways, but just seeing in our differences that we're all quite similar. Uh, in, in my work as a therapist, coach, and consultant, what I've and human, just being human, I find that we all have very similar uh, questions or desires. And the question is, you know, who am I? And, and I think we all have varying gifts if we really tap into them. Uh, what is my purpose? Uh, and also, worthiness often comes up. Am I worthy? And my question to all of that is, yes, you are worthy. Yes, you do have an intuitive gift. The the world can get us quite busy in doing and checking boxes. But if we really take time, there's an intuitive gift that we all have. And when we're able to share that uh, with one another, you know, to me, that's the purpose of life. Uh, In your bio, as I said, off record, you say, I believe that individual healing becomes collective healing. That caught my attention because the idea of healing, it's so profound to me. So let me ask you the question, how do you define healing and what are the obstacles to healing? 
Okay. So healing, um, for my social work background, and I'm uh, sort of stepping back a bit, zooming out, they break down macro, meso, and micro. So macro is the political. It's sort of these larger entities that impact us in our world. Uh, Meso is family, community, church. uh, And then you have the individual experience. So as a Black woman, my experience on a micro level, meso and macro, might be quite different from someone else who's positioned in this world. And so when I say individual healing, what I'm saying is as individuals, the more that we seek our truths, and when I say truth, uh, those heavy parts of our lives and experiences, um, those unique parts of us, our fears, the more that we address that on an individual level, it has an impact on that then meso level that then has an impact on that macro level. And as we're holding today on a spiritual level. So the more that we do our own work, and when I say work, the work of healing, the work of unpacking what's there, that it's going to ripple into our relationships, into our family, into our community, into our politics, <laughs> and, and how we do everything. Uh, and so healing to me is unpacking it and allowing yourself um, in a safe way. Because don't, don't get me wrong, unpacking is not easy. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> we, we can think of healing as like this all exciting, glorious process. No, it's heavy. It can be icky. It can be overwhelming. But that goes back to the sense of collective and community that you don't do it alone. You're a part of larger communities um, where you're sharing your story is your superpower. Uh, even if you're not verbally sharing, you can share through dance, through song, uh, through art. And so healing to me is doing the work of unpacking and understanding your triggers, your fears, your joys, uh, because those things that we don't, we're, we're not aware of can control us. And so the more we are aware of our stuff, it will make for a better uh, relationships, communities, and is essentially a world make the world much better when we unpack those things in a safe I love what you just said about whatever we are not aware of controls us. I never heard it that way, but it's so true. What is true power to you, Tina? What I'm learning in my journey is true power goes back to what we just held is awareness. Um, That when I think over my beautiful 38 years, um, I spent a lot of that time in um, autopilot or um, checking the boxes, business as usual. And with that, it didn't allow for me to truly be present with what I was feeling, what I was needing. And so where I am today, I feel so much power and having awareness of when I'm feeling tension in my neck or I'm feeling um, an overwhelming feeling, I can say, oh, okay this is happening, Um, this was said or this was done. I have awareness of my triggers. I feel true power in that. Um, And and based on those things that may upset me, I take care of myself. I don't just push through or uh, resiliency can be tricky because to me, resiliency without process is a hot mess. And so to me, it's, yeah, I'm resilient and I'll, I'll get through this, but right now, I have the power to say, sit, rest, cry. So there's just power in embracing my f- full humanness. I hold feelings on a spectrum. Um, and when I say a spectrum, I don't assign feelings as negative or positive. I assign them as heavy or light. And, and what I find is we often want all the joy, happiness, and you know all, all the glittery stuff, which is important. But until we're able to acknowledge our relationship with anger, rage, jealousy, shame, it takes away from our ability to truly access joy. And so I look at, again, feelings on a spectrum of how do I grapple through that life can bring me joy and laughter one moment and it can bring heaviness, sorrow and sadness the next and, and not to split myself of, myself of happy or not happy. I'm a full being who's allowed to feel all of these emotions. 
Um, I feel power in that. That is a beautiful message. Um, yes, a trillion times to that, to honoring feelings and being whole, feeling whole, which it is we are here to experience everything. Perhaps some of us don't experience everything, per se, in the sense of deep, deep pain, but it's still possible and could happen. So I love the idea of being open to life. And thank you for you being open to life as you come across very much to me and doing the work, this beautiful work of helping yourself and others to grow. It's truly beautiful, Tina. Thank you. At this time, what do you feel is the, the world's greatest need, the greatest priority? I would say the world's greatest priority would be, that's a great question, right? I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful but big question. Is to be able to step back in, into humanness. Uh, in, in this very busy, busy world, we can, we've can we become quite robotic, <laughs> you know, going back to just producing and going. And so getting back to human as I said before, that although we have differences, if we really, really tune in, we have more in common than we have uh, different. And so you, you had several segments around storytelling and there's so much power in that storytelling because when you gather folks together and folks start to tell their story, it creates alignment that even though we come from very different parts of the world, that there's alignment. And so I would say right now the world needs to get back to what it means to be human, what it means to tell our stories. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to be able to do our work to identify and know what our fears are, um, what our triggers are. Like it goes back to that self-awareness. Yeah. So it's, um, we all need therapy, <laughs> in other words. <laughs> we oh all my God, need we do. therapy. <laughs> I'm yes. a therapist with a therapist <laughs> to be able to take what our, our thoughts, our feelings and take it somewhere to, to just line it out, you know, to be able to line it out and make sense of it. We all need therapy. Yes, we do. <laughs> oh, I wish we had presidents, <laughs> all the leaders of our countries, all the countries in the world, they're all therapists. That would be incredible. Who knows, right? That's a beautiful vision. That's right. That's, I mean, but think about it. It goes back to that, that micro, meso, macro. The more that people are healing and doing that work on a micro level, it, it is going to ripple into those more macro level settings like politics. You are a clinical social worker a change agent, coach, consultant, and the founder of Therapy Works in Truth and Muse Creative Consulting. And Truth, it's uh, actually written a little bit differently. T, and then you have a period, and then Ruth, because it's uh, associated to your name. So Got it. talk to me about what was the inspiration to become who you are today, Tina? And what is the purpose, the main purpose of your work? Well, I'll give a bit of a silly story of T. Ruth Truth. Um, about 12, 13 years ago, let's see, I, my birthday is October 10th. Um, and so the year of 10, 10, 10, I somehow looked at my name and I mean, it took 20 plus years. And I said, there's truth in my name. And so when I align truth in this 10, 10, 10, birthday, it was a celebration of truth, not realizing at that time that it would become uh, a vision or a business, right? Um, a mission in some ways. And so I do this work because it, it's needed. I'm, I do believe it's a, a, a gift, but I, I've even grappled a bit with if something is your calling, I mean, this has been my grapple, if something is your calling, at times it can feel without boundary or without, um, without, you can't make a mistake, right? I put a lot of pressure on myself around what it meant to be a healer. And so during the global pandemic, 
I step back a bit to say I am a healer, a therapist, and... And so that was the creation of Truth and Muse, which uh, has been in the works for decades uh, in my life because I'm always curious. Uh, I started, how, there's sort of an origin story where folks ask like, where, where did this begin for you? And, and as a child, I would often be in my room coloring or creating and my parents, doing the best that they could do, um, you know, had moments of ups and downs. And I put down my coloring book, I'm an only child, to better understand what they were talking about. And I think that's where a lot of my journey began, is trying to understand humans and why we say and do the things that we do. So then it rippled into uh, my first job at a daycare. I was maybe 15 years old and there was a child throwing a chair around and I picked up pen and paper and began to ask him how he was feeling. Now, at that time, I didn't realize uh, that this would be my you know, uh, work, but I was trying to heal myself, right? Like I was trying to make sense of my own world. And so this journey has started with me with trying to heal and work through my own wounds. And uh, it then turned into something that I was able to see in other people when they were going through things to want to hold that experience with them. Now, years and training later, it's, it's much more balanced. Um, and, I, and I know how to incorporate myself uh, more into the healing work, meaning uh, during the pandemic, I was a heck of a holder for others, but I did not necessarily do the same for myself. And so that's why I am a therapist and so there's therapy works and then there's truth and muse that is beyond the therapeutic space. To me, truth and muse is getting out there because not everyone may show up in a therapy room. So how do we get out there? and uh, make impact and create healing spaces beyond the therapy space. Uh, so Truth and Muse is uh, a creative consulting uh, business, but it's really seeking anyone who's into uh, contribution, uh, creativity, innovation. Let's talk. Let's come in, in community to create solutions um, for what we're experiencing right now because we need it. We really need it. Before we talk about, more specifically about truth and muse, that topic about creativity, which is so close to my heart, has to do with self-discovery, of course, and healing. What is the best way to meet you? If somebody wants to hire you as a therapist, would be your website? What's the best sure. way to? So um, I have a LinkedIn page that links in all these uh, varying parts of me. Uh, that's a whole in one place. And I have a LinkedIn um, account that I think you'll uh, be posting. But I have a website. It's truth, T R U T H, uh, and muse. So it's and muse uh, spelled out. So truthandmuse.com. Yeah. The topic of truth and muse creativity as a form of self discovery, healing, and resistance. That word caught my attention. Again, I'm always looking for things that would stop me. <laughs> that stopped me. I paused and I was like, what does it have to do with anything? Uh, resistance. So I guess that's my first question. What's the connection between resistance and truth, muse, creativity, self-discovery, and healing? Yes. So my resistance is, is uh, with business as usual. The whole narrative of business as usual. Um, I, I will hold more specifically during the pandemic, there was such a split. And when I say a split, um, I would be watching the news and on the corner of the broadcast would be the numbers of people that we were losing here in the States, but also globally. And on that same screen were people smiling about, ooh, COVID cupcakes, right? Like, so I was watching um, devastation, but also sort of denial playing out all at once. And I was finding that in so many different settings where no one was talking about truly or calling out truly 
what was going on. So we have the numbers and we have cupcake parties to, to make everyone smile. And so throughout the pandemic, I felt more and more frustration and anger. And I had to channel that because if we don't, uh, if we're not aware of what's happening, again, our, our emotions can control us. Uh, and so whenever I, because I have a relationship with my emotions and I'm um, very much in conversation with my emotions, I, I channeled that conversation around, well, what do I do with this? I have this anger, this frustration, this grief, you know, people around me are dying and we're talking about happiness, COVID cupcakes. Yeah. <laughs> so so right. my resistance is to business as usual, because if we are applying the same business as usual narrative to what we're going through right now, it, we have to kind of split off a part of ourselves. And I don't want to split myself. I want to live whole. And so my resistance is to move away from business as usual, to allow myself to live authentically if something doesn't feel right, smell right, taste right, whatever it may be, to be able to address it and to talk about it. Um, I had a teenage client during COVID who said to me, I just want my teacher to say, this sucks. He, he had difficulty accessing the learning environment, not because he didn't have the ability to learn, but he just wanted someone to acknowledge his lived experience before he was able to access that curriculum. Mm. Uh, resistance also to me is joy. Yeah. If we want true sustainable change, then we have to have joyful moments in order to make a true impact. Because if we don't, we burn out. Um, resistance is when I wake up in the morning and something inside says lay back down <laughs> to lay back down for five more minutes um, instead of hopping up. So uh, I mean, I can give a lot of different examples of resistance and what it means. But all of it to me is a way of sustaining the fight. And when I say the fight for wellness, the fight for um, our humanness, uh, the fight for love, peace, truth. Yeah. I can go on. Uh, I never heard it that way. That's very refreshing to hear that, how the integration of the meaning of resistance when it comes to everything else around it. We often try to push away or judge resistance, but it's a movement, isn't it, towards something. And another open question. It's about your own definition of truth. How do you define truth? And also, how do you describe what the muse is or your muse is? Um, so in preparation for our talk, I threw a whole like <laughs> sit down and, and Googles, but even with Google, who's the framer of the information that I'm reading? But I sat with truth and, and truth to me often lies in the middle. And when I say the middle, um, I can give a bit of, a, let's see, an example of we live in a world currently where somewhere someone is experiencing pain, devastation, and grief. But we also live in a world at this very moment where there's a child playing under an, an apple tree smiling. And if we're not careful, we can split ourselves to say, what a wonderful, great, magical world, or, you know, what a devastating world. But the reality is it's, it's both. And, and how do we grapple with that? How do we grapple with these, uh, there's a word, dualities? How do we grapple with it where we bring it into a, a, a one, oneness, as they call it? Uh, also, you can have one person or maybe two people that are going up a mountain and they are looking at the uh, clouds or looking at, um, you know, the beauty around. One person's perspective of that truth is, wow, I'm, I'm a part of something so much bigger than me. How amazing. Where someone else or that same person may have a moment of reflecting of, I'm so tiny and insignificant in something so big, right? And so it's, it's just being able to take all of this and to grapple through it. And in that, 
lies uh, some of the, the truth or, or the truth, not some of it, probably all of it. Um, and then even an example of a caregiver, you may have a caregiver who protected you, who looked out for you, who loved you, but also that caregiver may have disappointed or fell short, um, but they're still a full being who's that and. And so truth to me is somewhere in the middle. Truth to me is the grappling. Um, truth to me can represent so many things, but it's, it's something about that middle, that oneness, that wholeness. Yes, lovely said. So it's being able to hold space for everything, isn't it? Being able to be clear enough to see that life can be everything, not just one, not hold one perspective, which is very narrow, very small. You made me think about a space like this um, being vast within, within the, the realm of the mind, where we can just embrace everything as exactly as it is happening. It's a spiritual concept. is one that I, I hold as a truth for myself personally, that life is exactly that. The grappling, as you call it, to live from that space of vastness, where we can just play with the opposites, with the duality, as you said, and the paradox. Well, well and, and actually so, something I did note is uh, just truth tellers. And, and so going back to what is truth to me, um, two prolific writers uh, and activists that come to mind is Thich Nhat Hanh and uh, James Baldwin. And with the two of these amazing individuals, and, and uh, they both have passed on, uh, they have been able to speak to me in a way that pierces through, like just pierces through. And, and I would say um, give word or... Uh, Let's see, was it? to give words to things that I didn't even realize were there. Um, and so to me, those are two truth tellers that I've really leaned on in this journey uh, of, of understanding and, and grappling through truth. It's beautiful how we find these people throughout life that resonate with the truth that we, like you said, we don't have even words to describe, but then there comes someone that kind of clearly says it. <laughs> and we're like, oh my God, this is it. I want to be like this, or I want to be around them. <laughs> and it gives release. It gives that release of something that may have been laying dormant. <laughs> right, that we are not alone with that truth, right? That it's actually open and other human beings are sharing that. I felt very lonely throughout my life, very isolated and not fitting in anywhere. Because of that, I could not find the other human that could speak the language that my heart understood. And then I finally did. <laughs> and that changed everything. And you know what? As you say that, uh, something that I didn't mention earlier, where uh, we have more similarities and differences, is we're seeking belonging. Like a sense of belonging is so important. We say collective or community, but that sense of belonging. Yeah, let me ask you the question because I have been actually kind of talking a lot more about belonging. What is the feeling behind that word? Be belonging for me is a hug. Yeah, <laughs> like it's, it's, that it's hug. It's a hug feeling. <laughs> and what what tends to be a uh, an indicator because you you called it out of belonging can be dangerous. <laughs> it, it can. But it, there's something around uh, when I'm with someone and we're together, I feel uh, a sense of togetherness, a sense of oneness. But even when they're away, they're still with me. And, and so when we're leaning towards that sense of belonging that maybe isn't coming from a healthy place, it can feel a bit like a craving of the only time that you're feeling that sense of belonging is when that person is with you. And that can be quite an a, uh, anxious attachment, right? What I'm speaking of is a secure sense of belonging that when you're with me physically, you're with me, I feel a sense of belonging. But even when you're away, I feel you. I feel that hug. I feel heard. I feel connected. It's, it's a hug. The same hug is when I'm sitting outside and the sun touches me. You know, I, I feel a sense of belonging with the sun. 
Um, so that that's how I would describe belonging, a hug when you're with me, but also when you're not with me, I still feel you. That resonates, energetically resonates true as well. Yeah, I can feel when, as you speak. It's interesting, I have to say that um, throughout the conversation, the way you speak, it has a lot of energy behind it. Um, I can feel everything. So it's amazing. I love that. <laughs> yeah, thank you for being a truth teller. That's what they do. So I guess for me, when it comes to that understanding of what that is, belonging, the sense is, uh, the feeling is unconditional love. That's what sets in. Like I am unconditionally loved. By who, it doesn't even matter. It's almost like by life itself. It's something that I cannot see, but it's here all the time. It's not hidden. It's right here. Yes. Even even in, in the heaviest, darkest moment, it's it's there. It's it's with you um, to help and guide you through. Is that a practice? Um, you got it. I was just about to say it. So it's, it is a practice. It is a practice. I mean, from my own experience, when, you know, the sun is hitting just right and the weather is great and I'm getting great news, I'm more likely to make all of these decisions where I'm like, wow, yeah. good job. Um, <laughs> yeah. Whereas at times when I'm under stress and, and stress can represent, uh, you know, moving to a new house or just any sort of change that we can regress and regress means to go back to a original sort of defense or way of coping to protect yourself. And so it is a practice every single day to acknowledge and to be aware of. I mean, that's the power, the awareness. It's not that you go around every single day, happy, happy, joy, joy. It's that you're aware of what's happening. And I hold, you know, if the sun can come and go, if the weather can change at any <laughs> drop of a dime or the seasons change, who are we to think that we won't have a moment of rain or a moment of thunder? And so it goes back to that connection with nature of if nature has the ability to have ups, moves, change, shifts, who are we to be any different? And if every day was sunny, if every day was sunny, that wouldn't be a good situation for our environment. We need rain, right? We need tears. We need the changes that happen in season in order to nurture um, our land. But also, you think about it, our tears, our ups, our downs, it helps to nurture and give clarity to our lived experiences. And so it is a practice. The practice of staying in alignment, staying connected, or, or even stay in that space of awareness. Absolutely. Yep. And, 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 and extending self-compassion for those moments where you're like, well, I could have or I should have. No, you, you acknowledge what happened and, and be kind and compassionate to yourself. Lovely said. I love your message. It's profound. It's simple, but not easy. <laughs> uh, it's clear. Thank you, Tina, for reminding us about these things. These important things, I have to say, although I try not to hold on to anything as important. So there's no too much of, um, let's say, of solidity. I notice that the, the more solid I become in a sense of ideas or concepts, and then the more challenging it becomes to be flexible, to be open in life. Yes. And that goes for um, the idea of change. So you said that in a very powerful way about nature, that everything changes. It seems to me that that's why most of us humans suffer it's because we resist, we push away, try to escape change, but that's the nature of life, right? Yes. Uh, so what's coming to mind is the grief process. And I have friends that whenever I start talking about grief, because I bring it up all the time, yeah, I'm no, good. talking about it, and they're like, oh my God. <laughs> um, but just through, uh, I lost my father in my early 20s. And so um, in losing him, it introduced very early. Uh, well, OK, let me be real. I was in complete denial and not addressing my grief for years. But when I was finally able to sit still long enough, um, and when I say sit still five minutes here, two minutes there, that's what shifted my life. Um, but the grief process is something that I'm very uh, in tuned with and I uh, 
encourage that we grieve a little bit every day, meaning we, we make time for our grief. So the grief process, and they're extending it to seven stages, but I'll stick to the traditional five, is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So each day we are saying hello and goodbye to the day, to the night, to the next day. And so a truth that we often grapple or maybe in denial about is there's a lot of hellos, goodbyes, and depending on your belief, hellos again. Um, But there's constant change and loss that we experience um, in our day to day, uh, just as each day rolls by. And so I try to practice in my life a way of grief being ever present because as you go through the stages, acceptance is that at not necessarily the end, because depending on what's going on, you can be in any particular stage of grief. But acceptance is based on what is, what can I, you know, what what can I create? What ways can I honor those that are no longer here with me? And in my therapeutic work and just being a uh, participant of this life, we can often get stuck in the bargaining, the could have, the would have, the should have. And, and if we are living in a place of acceptance that means based on what is, I can. It's like, what can I do right now, mindfully? You know, instead of um, thinking about, let me call that loved one or let me do, do it. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's a way of giving permission to live now. Live now. Live now. Mm. You know. Uh, That's another powerful message. Yeah. Being present to what is present. Being here. Not trying to escape this moment. What is happening. And we often do. I do believe that that's the cause of uh, suffering, because pain yes. is inevitable, but suffering, it's a choice, it's an option, as it has been said, by not being here. And it's interesting how we try to escape, especially feelings and emotions, yeah, those heavy ones, as you mentioned earlier, you described as being heavy. We try to escape them, and then we just make things worse. Yeah. So with that in mind, going through some of the notes I made here, what would you consider one of the most challenging truth that we struggle with as humanity? Would you say death? <laughs> that comes to mind. <laughs> well, I, I guess just, just holding on to what we were discussing, um, l- loss, death, uh, I, I believe that we are equipped to go through the grieving process, but that bargaining stage, that bargaining stage can leave us quite stuck where we're living in the past of the woulda, coulda, shouldas with our loved ones. Um, and so it's, it's actually going back to Thich Nhat Han, his book Fear uh, was a very powerful book for me to read. It's a short read, but you don't want to read it quickly. Like you, you want to take your time and pace. And in the very beginning of his book, he identified uh, the five original fears Now, I'm not going to get it exact, but it said something like this. You're going to die. Your family's going to die. If you age, you will potentially lose mobility. I mean, it listed out straight up (laughs) these original fears. And I was offended. I didn't want to read that. You know, I I want some cushioned way of understanding fear. I didn't ask for this. So what I found, though, is my ability to grapple with these original fears make everything else that I experience day to day in the grand scheme of things, small potatoes. And when I say small potatoes, I don't want to dismiss our day to day lived experiences. But if we really get to the root of our original fears, it allows us to live, if not fearlessly, but maybe living with awareness of our fear. So in the book, he says fear is there you invite it essentially to the table to have a discussion of fear. I know you're there. What's up? You know, let, let's work through this. Let's talk about this. And so I would say a hard truth for us is um, not just death, but just loss or change. Uh, let's say that you're transitioning from, uh, you know, single life into a partnership Well, you're having to grieve a bit once of what your uh, identity was as this single individual into partnership. Uh, Let's say that you uh, have a child. Well, if you're busy 
thinking about the good old days before the kid doesn't necessarily allow you um, an opportunity to be fully present in, in motherhood. So how do you allow yourself to grieve through even these stages of life? And the more that we generalize that to everything, when it does come time to grapple through death, it won't feel as um, overwhelming because you're already practicing it in in the day-to-day um, experiences or life transitions. Um, trying to think what else comes to mind. Uh, yeah, I, I would just say loss and change in general, not just death, uh, loss and change, because we can stay stuck in the good old days of you know, bargaining what used to be instead of living in what is. And that's interesting because I have seen that uh, some people around me, they love the 70s, the music of the <laughs> 70s, and they stay there forever. And they, they actually wear the same clothes and they do everything. And they look like somebody that came from that time. And they stay there because it makes them feel good. And they are constantly criticizing the now, how things have changed and the music is no good <laughs> and all that. It's kind of funny. You simplified that. Yeah, loss and change. Death is just part of life anyway. That's so true, Tina. Change. Ah, that's a and, big one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even going back to bargaining, um, well, not bargaining. So the grief, we are equipped to grieve. But going back to my resistance of business as usual, business as usual isn't very kind to, to taking time to take care of or allow yourself to grieve. I mean, even when it comes to uh, losing a loved one, you get maybe two days to a week to figure it out and get zipped back up <laughs> and get to business as usual. And so business as usual can get in the way of our grief process mm. for sure. Um, We're almost at the end and I do have so many other questions here. <laughs> creativity. What is the form of creativity from your perspective or inexperience that has the most impact in our health, well-being, and healing? Um, well, I'll, I'll speak from my experience of, uh, I'm a daydreamer. <laughs> and, and so I, I often say to folks, like, I'm an appreciator of the arts, uh, but I'm not necessarily, you know, a, a painter or a prolific writer. I, I aspire to be. Uh, but the ability to daydream is so powerful because it allows you to, and, and let, let me be real here. I'm not talking about dissociating, like disconnecting from reality. I'm talking about daydreaming. It, it takes you into spaces uh, that you may not see in front of you, but that can forge a path, a, a, a path for you. So going back to my earlier days in the pandemic, uh, Truth and Muse wasn't even a thought or concept at that time. But back then I knew that I wanted and desired something different. And so what was happening is all my creative ideas would come at night. Now that's no good when you're trying to sleep. I, I think that, I think yes. that uh, you know, great ideas come at night, but if it's only coming at night, that means there's something that's going on during the day that is not allowing me an opportunity to daydream and to create and to think. And so I started with, I want to create a life. I want to create a life where I have time to daydream, whatever it is, in my day-to-day -day schedule. I don't want to just wait until it's time to go to sleep. I want to create that. So that's where Truth and Muse was spun from, was just this desire for something more. And as time has gone on, it's become some a business. It's, it's something that I've created. Uh, but it started with a daydream and a desire. Uh, and uh, even going back to what shifted my life was, as I said earlier, five minutes here, two minutes there. The type of work that I have done, even before becoming a therapist, I was a school social worker or a hospital social worker. And I was in a constant state of uh, supporting people in crisis. And what I found was I was so activated by the end of the day. I didn't really know what was mine, what was, I, I had yeah. difficulty identifying where I was in any of it. And so when I transitioned to group private practice and let's say someone canceled a session or they were running 10 minutes late, it was the first time in my life that I really sat down without anticipating 
someone busting in with a crisis situation, right? And so it was those five minutes where I'm like, I feel sensations in my body. Am I anxious? <laughs> oh, I am anxious. Like it, it was like the self discovery in just five minutes here and two minutes there. And eventually I ended up craving and desiring more. But it was those times where I created, I daydreamed, I doodled, I wrote out things on a, on a sticky pad. Um, and so to me, the way that we tap into creativity is protecting our time, space, and energy to see where our mind goes and wanders. Now, with that being said, if we've experienced a lot of trauma or if we've experienced a lot of uh, just heavy stress in our lives, that quiet time can be uh, frightening. It can be quite frightening. And it may, I say boredom is a gateway emotion. And when I say a gateway, it can take us into those emotional spaces that we try to busy ourselves from. And so then we jump into insta happiness. Like we're, we're in some craving like state ping ponging to the other side of the spectrum because we don't want to sit long enough with those heavy uh, emotions. And so I would say with that, for folks that find their quiet time is uh, scary and overwhelming, therapy will benefit because your quiet reflective time is a part of the relationship you have with yourself, a part of the relationship you have with your God. And if you're spending your life busying through it, it may be a symptom of something, right? Like, what are you running from? Are you running from yourself? Are you running from uh, experiences that uh, you may not be ready to face? I get it. But there's something in that silence and ability to daydream to me that is where creativity comes from. And also our pains, our suffering, uh, creativity can be a part of our healing, painting, dancing, um, writing. Uh, I can go on, but daydream. Now I never heard it that way. It's so refreshing to listen to you. It just kind of stops everything. It's almost you create that uh, instant moment for reflection. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you, Tina. Yeah, it's just like thinking stops. <laughs> like, what's my next question? I have no idea. <laughs> Let me look at my notes. <laughs> and, some, and something that may help for um, folks that may be avoidant of those heavy feelings is because we can intellectualize things. So my, it may feel safer to uh, look up the feeling. So to identify I'm feeling, let's say the word is... Uh, I'm feeling despair. Okay. Well, identify the feeling and you may print out something that has a whole bunch of a list of feeling words. And you may then say, that is the feeling that I'm experiencing. Then you go look it up, look at the definition. After you look at the definition, use it in a sentence. After you use it in a sentence, maybe apply it to a particular experience. And so with these heavier emotions, I'm not saying to go jump in the deep end of heaviness, but you may start with just trying to gain a better understanding of it, use it in a sentence, uh, try to hear it from someone else's perspective before you're able to incorporate it into your feelings wor world in some ways. Uh, so is that it's a process, it's a practice, as you said before. It's not something that we just jump into it, but also it helps a lot when we have support, when we have a community, when we have other people around. And I can't emphasize that enough. It's such a wonderful decision to make, to work with others, a therapist or a coach or anyone who can support us. So thank you for being that person, Tina. I would love for you to talk to me for a moment to perhaps even go through the practice itself. It's a practice called free association that we spoke off record and you sent me some materials too about it. So I would love to hear more about that, Tina. Yes. So to, to honor a bit of our uh, talk today, which is truth and muse, creativity as a form of self-discovery, healing and resistance, I have a, an invitation, an invitation. And my invitation today is for uh, listeners to engage in a free association practice. And in this practice, it can be nonverbal. Uh, actually, I would encourage nonverbal and facial expression and body movement. 
Um, and so we often can try to use words to express, but I want us to engage in the nonverbal and um, physical uh, facial expression and physical body movement. Now, I do have a disclaimer. If you start to feel overwhelming sensations, pause, breathe, and you can just listen. So this is an invitation. Confused, empty, stuck, anger, wide, tall, hate, love, rage, frustration, closed, love, fear, scream, release, freedom, sky, clouds, tree, tears, joy, full, protection, embrace, pain, water, permission, let go, fire, curiosity, release, laughter, renewed, grounded, door, open, open. I invite you to cultivate, create, and evoke change. Amazing. I felt the word water more than any other word. I'm wondering why. <laughs> I don't want to overanalyze it, <laughs> but expansion. I just, that was the, the feeling of expanding. And it's almost like thoughts that they were narrow and kind of um, maybe upright. They just kind of melted. And, and that's, that was interesting. Uh, the, the well, with the word selection, it was going back to channeling the grief process and, and again, the stage of acceptance. And so we journeyed through together um, words that if you really allowed yourself, right, because it is a sort of consent and allowing yourself to be vulnerable, um, that each of these words have personal meaning to you. Um, and so it is an invitation for release and expression. And as we got towards the end, or we have grounded door open, um, that now it's sort of like, well, what do you do with it? You know, for me, for me, I'm kicking the door open. For someone else, it may be opening a door, but it really is just that grief process taking us all the way through into acceptance. I love that. That's very creative, isn't it? And I'm just kind of thinking about the whole, you doing this, kind of trying to visualize this in person, like with the group. That would be amazing. This is something that you're already doing, Tina. So actually, this is an activity that I've done in person, like pre-COVID with, uh, but it used to be an icebreaker. So uh, the cool thing is we would be surrounded by people people will be surrounded and showing different movements and expressions. And so it would always be exciting and ener energizing to see everyone's different take on these words. Um, so yes, this is something that I've done in the past more so as an icebreaker to open up the activity or the speech. I love the integration of the body, the movement and facial expressions. That goes back to the wholeness, right? The uh, Just feeling th this human experience as... It is, exactly. Mind, body, everything included, not trying to exclude anything. That sounds wonderful. Thank you so much again for this conversation today. Thank you so much for being you, Tina. And I appreciate you and the invitation. Thank you. And before we end the conversation today, I have one more question for you. That will be the ending question. What do you love most about being in the human body or being the human body? I, I would go back to the hug, the, that hug feeling. Um, and and we, we were talking about unconditional love and belonging sort of outside of ourselves with others. But it's also a bit of in what ways we are engaging into self-love and belonging as a whole being, um, as a whole person. 
how we accept ourselves for the, the dynamic beings we are. And so what I love most about myself is I can have one moment where I'm saying and expressing something profound, but then the next moment I may drop salsa in my lap and, you know, and, and, and being able to laugh. And so, so I would say laughter, humility, being able to, to laugh and to accept my full self of all the dynamic parts that come together that make me uniquely myself, uniquely human. So before we say goodbye again, where can we find more information about you, your work, products, services, and future projects, Tina? Um, so again, the simplest way right now would be my website, Truth and Muse, and it's spelled out Truth and muse.com. Um, but I do believe in the description, you'll have access to my uh, link tree, which will give you a bit of spice of my therapeutic work of Truth and Muse uh, and some of my social media uh, and uh, LinkedIn accounts as well. So I'm out there. You, you can find me, Tina Rutherford, Truth and Muse, Therapy Works. That's W-E-R-K-S. You put me out there, you'll find me. And, and my picture is probably this big, luscious, beautiful fro. You'll see me. <laughs> so I'll have those links on your podcast profile too. Thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. Bye for now, Tina. Take care, folks. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Tina J. Rutherford and her work, please visit linktr.ee backslash Tina underscore J underscore Rutherford. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.